and can I thank him particularly for agreeing to come at very short notice. And um, uh, though we are involved in um, a matter of controversy, I very much hope that this can be resolved as quickly as possible so that it does not distract from the great debate which this uh, country is involved with. And I'm sure uh, Cabinet Secretary would agree. If you could identify yourself for the record, please. Yeah, Secretary and Head of the Home Civil Service. Thank you very much. Um, we don't want to keep you for too long, um, so um, we will try and keep our questions as brief as possible, if you could keep your answers as short as possible. Otherwise, I, I will pull you up, and I will pull up my colleagues. But I mean, I will also pull you up if I find you, you are answering the question that I haven't, or a member of the committee has not asked. Uh, it was our experience this morning with Sir Jonathan Stevens that he tended to provide an answer to a question that had not been asked, and we, were, we did not get clarity. And I'm reminded that the um, minister yesterday said, at the end of his statement, I hope this clarity will allow members on both sides of the House to focus on the main debate. Uh, at the moment, I'm bound to say, if we have clarity, I hate to think what um, a muddle looks like. Um, so could I ask, um, first of all, could you outline the steps which led you to produce this guidance? Uh, well, I think we started with the 1975 guidance. Uh, we looked at the Scottish referendum guidance. We looked at this committee's or this predecessor's committee's uh, observations on that guidance. Um, we talked to the Prime Minister, and we uh, that produced the guidance. Obviously, in the middle of all that, the Prime Minister produced a letter on the January January the 11th, which set out the, the sort of overarching principle that we're dealing with here, which is that the government has an official position on the question in out. And pretty much everything else flows from that starting point. Civil service's job, as you know, Mr Chairman, under the Constitution, is to support the government of the day, and that's what the guidance does. It puts flesh on the Prime Minister's letter of January the 11th and sets out clearly, as clearly as we could, uh, that the civil service's job, therefore, is to support the government of the day in making its position clear, whilst uh, obviously being able to support ministers who are dissenting from that position on all other aspects of government business. And um, uh, who did you consult in addition to the Prime Minister? Well, I consulted my expert team inside the Cabinet Office, and I consulted one or two senior permanent secretaries. Um, but it didn't, frankly, seem to me to be a matter of great controversy, because it's based, as I say, very carefully on the 1975 precedent, the Scottish referendum guidance, which this committee had plenty of opportunities of commenting on but chose not to uh, raise any great concerns about. And I think it's, in some sense, a statement of common sense that if the government has a position, that's the position the, government, the civil service will support. Um, uh, you, you keep referring to the 1975 precedent, and I'm reminded uh, again of Philip Ziegler's remarks that the British Constitution is constructed of many instantly, uh, instantly created precedents. Um, uh, and where is the precedent in 1975 for the extent of denial of information to dissenting ministers uh, that um, is proposed in your guidance? Well, I think there's been a misunderstanding, if I may say so, about the denial of information to ministers who are not supporting the government's position. The area where the civil service is not going to be providing advice to ministers in that position is very... It's very specific. It's set out in the Prime Minister's letter. It's set out in my guidance to permanent secretaries, which is the provision of briefing material and speech material, because we don't think it's appropriate. The Prime Minister doesn't think it's appropriate. I don't either. It didn't have it in 75. Very much the same precedent uh, to provide material to ministers who want to argue against the government's position, so that they can make that case against the government. So that's the material that is being denied to them. All the other material that they need to run their departments, to answer parliamentary questions, um, to handle European business that is not related to the question, uh, normal EU business, of course we'll continue to provide the usual limousine service. Um, I've, I've quoted him before, the, the former Permanent Secretary Sir Peter Thornton, who was looking after Peter Shaw at the time, who said, uh, it was jolly difficult putting forward anti-common market briefs to Mr Shaw, but I hope we did what he asked. Is that what you expect permanent secretaries to do in this government for well, dissenting ministers? I actually brought along the guidance from 1975, which says in terms, 
Um, civil servants may provide normal office facilities and factual information on European matters on request to ministers who differ, but they should not be asked to provide briefing or draft speeches contrary to the government's recommendation. So that's so the position? That is the position in 1975. So I don't know what he was doing. But is, that, is that the position now? That is the position in 1975. The position is that the now position is, now? The position as set out in my guidance is what is the position now. So in what respect does your, position, your guidance today differ from the position in 1975? I don't think it does materially in relation to the civil service. In relation to SPADs, I think there were minor differences, but there, were no, there was no special advisory code in those days and so on. So from the point of view of clarity then, uh, you just read out the words from the 1975 guidance. Those are your instructions to civil service no, you, today. as I've just told you, my, my guidance is set out in my own words in the letter I sent around. So in what week. respect does your guidance differ from 1975? I don't think it does. But in material respects in relation to the civil service, I don't think it does. Hmm. But I'm just saying that the specific guidance that I set out last week is what I'm setting out is my guidance this time round. Peter Riddell, the esteemed head of the Institute for Government, has put out a blog today, which makes it quite clear that he thinks that this is broadly consistent with 75, uh, and it is. In a note of a telephone conversation between Sir Douglas Allen, the then head of the Civil Service, and Sir John Hunt, the then Cabinet Secretary, on the 24th of February 1975, Sir Douglas Allen commented that officials should produce briefing when requested, but of a neutral kind, putting both points of views from which ministers could extract the information that they wanted. Is that what you've instructed civil servants to do? Uh, no, I've set out, I've instructed, I've instructed civil servants, I've given them guidance as to what to do in my letter of last week, and I've just read out the 1975 Harold Wilson memo that set out what civil servants were obliged to do in 75, which I think is broadly consistent with what I'm doing. The operative bit, as I said, is that the civil servants should not be asked to provide briefing or draft speeches contrary to the government's recommendation, which is, is the, <coughs> the hard kernel of what this guidance that I issued last week is about. No more, no less. Um, moving on to question number two. Um, Sir Jeremy, um, you very uh, helpfully circulated um, uh, alongside your letter a Q&A sheet, yeah. um, which has been provided to us. Mm -hmm. um, but I understand that the Q&A sheet was not published um, uh, at the time you published your, your uh, letter. Um, why was it not published? Because I would have thought in the interests of openness and transparency, which you're obviously wishing to pursue, that it would have been helpful um, to have published this alongside your letter. And will you ensure that such guidance is always published in future? Yeah, just to be clar clarify on the Q&A. The Q&A briefing is provided by my office at working level, the Permanent Secretary's office, to help them interpret the guidance. The guidance is the key document. The Q&A is... Uh, a living document that we update over time. We'll issue another version of it in the next week or so, I should think. Our normal experience at the start of a period of PERDA or a regulated period is that there are lots of teething problems, lots of questions, lots of details of issues, particularly from civil servants who haven't been part of this before. We generally issue them with the sort of a handy Q&A guide, but that needs refining over time. But, but the handy Q&A guide um, differs in the language from your letter. Um, the language of, uh, of your letter or the Q&A guide is, is a, talking about uh, papers uh, that have a bearing on the referendum question, uh, whereas in your own letter you refer to issues relating to the referendum question. Now, uh, first of all, would you agree that uh, there is a material difference between those two points? Um, and there wasn't and how, intended to be, to be how, can, I, can I, sorry, can I just finish? Sorry, um, I mean, can you be confident that uh, uh, all civil servants will not have some confusion over those two different expressions that you've used in this instance? How can you ensure that there is consistency of interpretation across the civil service? Well, we continue to talk to private officers who raise questions of interpretation with us and obviously give a consistent line. All I will say, I think, is that the Prime Minister's letter and my guidance are the guiding documents here. They set out very clearly what we're talking about. The spirit is clear. All normal government business, including EU business, continues, except in relation to the in-out question, where we don't provide briefing material or speech material for ministers to attack the government, the government position. That is the material we're talking about. That is what the Q&A refers to. The Q&A should be interpreted very much within the context of the guidance that's been set out, which is the overarching can you, document. But can, I will, can you give me needs, an example? Can you give me an example, a practical example, of what uh, material may have a bearing on the referendum question? You know, pick a department at large, say... Well, if, if it's not happened, 
uh, because the guidance is very clear on this, I think, but if a minister who wanted to, to uh, argue against the government position commissioned a, a brief to find some facts uh, you know, that would stand up that position or a line of argument, that would be ruled out by the guidance because that's exactly the sort of information that would have a bearing on the referendum question. But, but, but Mr Hancock yesterday said all ministers can ask for factual briefing and for facts to be checked in any manner. That's right. How is a civil servant going to be able to tell um, that a minister is going to use any facts that he or she asks for within his department um, to form the basis of um, a speech which is uh, for the Vote Leave campaign as opposed to the Remain Well, campaign. I think the guidance is very clear. That if, if, if a minister who wants to vote against uh, Britain's membership asks civil servants to check the facts in a speech, then that is legitimate. But, but, explicitly, so there's no judgment required. But ministers aren't stupid. Um, well, and, and a minister is not... Uh, <laughs> Well, Mr. Flynn thinks all ministers are stupid, um, but 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 you know, a minister is is quite entitled to ask his or her official to produce a series of facts, and then there is no control that that civil servant can have over the way in which that minister uses those facts. Nevertheless, I think it's uh, so. Isn't it a bit consistent, pointless? It's consistent with the spirit in which the prime minister and the cabinet discussed this, that we should try and be as helpful as possible, both sides would be would operate in a, in, a, in a positive spirit. And as in 75, so now, the Prime Minister was comfortable that civil servants could provide factual, like, facts to ministers who want to argue well, against. Well, it's not, it's not comfortable, is it? I mean, the, the, the past... Well, it's not a usual situation, but let me say, no, let me say this. The only exceptional thing about all this is that the Prime Minister has, very exceptionally, allowed a number of ministers to stay in the government even though they oppose the government's policy. That is what's exceptional. Everything else follows from that. And we're trying to accommodate that as best we can within the absolute ethics and spirit and values of the civil service, which is to support the government of the day, but so it to is remain honest and impartial and all those other good things which we stand by day by day. That's okay. what so Jeremy, do. can I just ask you what um, the guidance um, contained in your letter and the internal Q&A, um, that was circulated to all cabinet members and um, uh, they all saw it before I think my guidance was circulated to permanent secretaries actually. Okay, the Prime so Minister's you, letter was circulated to Cabinet Ministers. But your guidance was not circulated to, to Cabinet Ministers, so they did not have sight of it. I, I can't remember. I think it was circulated to Permanent Secretaries, but I'm sure that it would have copied But wouldn't it have been helpful to um, have circulated that Q&A to Cabinet Ministers? Because after all, um, they were going to be asked to agree the process. And it might have shed some more light on what has turned out to I be a fairly controversial That would have given the Q&A a status well beyond what it was, which was working level guidance to Permanent Secretaries' private officers to help them you know, with interpreting how to fill in the details of the guidance. But the key thing is the guidance and the Prime Minister's letter. Can, we, can you just help me with, with um, other parts of ministerial life? Because um, from time to time, ministers and junior ministers, as well as, as, as Secretary of State, uh, attend cabinet um, subcommittees or cabinet mm -hmm. committees. Yeah. And it is not out with the realms of possibility, with the, the referendum coming up so shortly, that on those uh, cabinet uh, agendas and cabinet subcommittee agendas will be matters pertaining to this referendum. Will you be allowing junior ministers to stay attending those cabinet subcommittees or will you suspend the committee and ask those ministers that have said that they are supporting vote leave to remove themselves from those uh, committee meetings? We're all basically trying to run normal, normal government business. So if there's a cabinet committee set up to discuss an issue that needs to be dealt with now, uh, then ministers who are... But if it bears relation to, if, and, and it's quite likely, because European business rolls on on a daily basis, as we all know, um, if anything on those agendas has a bearing on the uh, referendum, would you be asking those ministers to leave the room? No, absolutely not, because I told you that the overall So they would be breaking, they would then be breaking the spirit of this um, uh, uh, modus operandi that you've set up. Well, we'd have to look at it case by case, but the spirit here is that this applies to proactive requests for information on briefing and uh, speech material. That right. is what we're okay. trying to stop. Okay. I mean, this sounds much more reasonable, and um, Thank you. I very much welcome that. Can I just clarify why in your letter you said it will not be appropriate or permissible for the civil service to support ministers who oppose the government's official proposition by, by providing briefing or speech material on this matter. This includes access to official departmental papers, accepting papers that ministers have previously seen, on issues relating to the referendum question prior to the suspension of the collective agreement. Mm -hmm. What papers do you not intend them to see? Briefings and speech material. So only briefings and speech material? 
That's the basic, that's the basic okay. principle, yes. So I, when, I you, when you say, okay, other... so in the, in the, in the, um, in the Q&A, they can see or commission any papers produced by the departments in the normal way, except those that have a bearing on the referendum question or are intended to be used in support of their position in the referendum. That only applies to briefings and well, speech that, material. That, that is the material we're talking about, yes. Okay. Because the normal so business... any material facts are, facts are available facts to a minister. Facts are dealt with in a different paragraph of my well, guidance. Though. I mean, this is marvellous. What a breath of fresh air. I can agree this more. Is so can much, agree this, more. Is, this is so straightforward. We might be able to shorten this whole session. That would be a pleasure. <laughs> it would. <laughs> um, but it's, it's not quite what the Minister was saying in the House yesterday. It's fully consistent with what the Minister was saying. It's fully um, consistent with what the Minister but, um, was saying. Um, I, I very much welcome, uh, welcome what you're saying. Um, if I may move on, I mean, um, to Ronnie Cowan. Or do you want to pitch in? Yes. Um, in the book called uh, Cameron at Ten by the well-respected authors Anthony Selden and uh, Peter Snowden, it said it gives a very interesting account of the Scottish referendum when it got to a very exciting point. And it says uh, they, they had a, a very pessimistic looking opinion poll. And it goes on to say this was a desperate blow. Carmichael tells Cabinet hours later that this is the time to hold your nerve and take the prospect seriously, but we have to stick to the strategy. Whitehall goes into rapid action examining how London might extend Scotland's powers, but at the same time looking at what further can be done to warn Scotland of the dangers of independence. Within Downing Street, Cameron's team decide to mobilise more business voices speaking out against independence. And at the most secret and confidential levels, discussions are taking place between, night, between number 10 and the palace about whether the Queen might be willing to express her views before it is too late. It, is that what happened? I never comment on royal matters. Well, I mean, let's take... Well, I, I, we think you should. This is a very serious matter. Because the Queen's opinions were conveyed to the voters in a subtle way. Uh, we, she didn't go to platform, make a speech. But it was conveyed to the voters that she said that Scotland should think carefully about their vote. And that was a message, quite clear, that she didn't approve of independence. Is that not so? I really don't want to get drawn into a... Are you politicised? Well, I'm accusing you all of collaborating and politicising of the royal family, that these matters were regarded as being uh, so important, the break of the United Kingdom, that something had, to, had to be done about it. I would never dream of trying to politicise Her Majesty the Queen. Well, you should... You, well, you're not defending your position on this. You have, were you involved I'm, I'm in discussions? I'm, 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 I'm simply not... Okay, well, let's, give you another, let's give you another piece of evidence that... Uh, on the 16th of February, uh, Prince William said, not very long ago, for centuries, Britain has been an outward-looking nation, hemmed in by the sea. We've always sought to explore what is beyond the horizon. The sense of mission and curiosity is something that I know continue to drive our economy, our cultural and educational export, and our armed forces and diplomatic services. And wherever we go, we have a long and proud tradition of seeking out allies and partners. In an increasingly turbulent world, our ability to unite in common action with other nations is essential. It's the bedrock of our security and prosperity and central to our work. Uh, wouldn't those words uh, be fine put into the campaign material uh, for those who want to stay in the European Union? I certainly wouldn't presume to advise the campaign. That's not my job. Civil but uh, uh, what I'm suggesting to you is that contrary to all precedent, uh, contrary to the reasons that the royal family has continued to be respected, is the fact that they weren't involved in politics, they weren't politically partial in any way. And here we've got examples, quite convincing examples, uh, that government, and possibly even the connivance of civil servants, have used the royal family uh, for party political aims. Is that not so? Are you involved in this? Did you take no, responsibility I, I, for it? I don't think there's been any attempt by anybody in the government, 
by the civil service to involve the, prime, the, the royal family in a politicisation. And these were just coincidences, these two I statements, think, particularly okay. the, the Prince's uh, statement. I think, we must, I think so, yeah. we must move back to the subject. But I just yeah, had one I, question. Hmm. Um, how normal would it be for the heir to the throne to make a speech in the Foreign Office that had not been seen by civil servants in advance? Uh, I honestly couldn't tell you that. Uh, I, think so, be un I think it would be unusual, probably, but I, so, I, so I, I don't... So it is likely that, that, that Number 10 had cited the speech before it was delivered? Was this the heir to the throne or Prince William? Prince William, sorry. I wouldn't know. I, I don't know what the clearance processes are for that. Um, I don't. I do not. Make a, make a final point, because, so, uh, could, Mr Hayward, we, we, we've spoken is it, is to it, you before. Is it reasonable for us to ask whether Number 10, anybody in Number 10, saw that speech before it was delivered? Well, you can ask. I just simply don't know the answer, I'm afraid. Could, could you provide an answer for us? I will seek to provide an answer. Thank you very much. So in I the think past, we'll, we've had questions to you about... Uh, I think we'll move on. I'll well, just get this, uh, this question in about Mr McPherson's. Uh, interference in the referendum where he issued guidance under his own name and uh, uh, Mr. Peter Hennessy has said that the government are daily inventing precedents to cover mistakes they make and in that case we were suggesting that this was without precedent, without major precedent and that it should not have been done. There was an example of the government, again, using the civil service to interfere in political matters. I mean, these are deeply serious charges against you. And you've got a bit of form on this because we remember your, uh, your okay. tribute to Mrs. Thatcher at the time. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, could you ask about the McPherson case? And, uh, Wait, sorry, is that a question? No, well, I, I, the question is, yeah. uh, were you, uh, d did that uh, transgress the traditions of the civil service for impartiality? Well, Here we got we, someone. We have, we have dealt with that matter before. Yeah, we, we have reported really us, we came to a conclusion which we condemned the yeah. actions. Yeah, we, we've we, been I completely think, consistent. In yeah, I think this committee had, its predecessor has been very consistent on right. that point. I think at the time the government made it very clear that was a very exceptional thing. Uh, there are precedents for it. We can go through them again if you want to. But it was very exceptional. I don't anticipate getting involved in that sort of thing in this referendum. I, I would like to get back mm, to the question as, as to why you've written to civil servants and issued a question and answer uh, briefing, which has led everyone to expect that civil servants are under an obligation to block information going to ministers when that is not the case. Uh, Mr Cowan. Yeah, uh, back to the here and now. Uh, when evil could, could change through standing orders, the adjudication as to whether it was evil or not evil fell upon the head of the Speaker. When it comes to this, the adjudication as to whether a paper should, a paper with a bearing on the referendum should be passed to a minister, who makes that decision? Well, the Permanent Secretary will uh, make that initial judgment, um, but I think in, in most cases it will be pretty obvious. And as I say, there haven't really been any problems so far in the interpretation of this guidance because it basically rely, it's referring to briefing and speech material that ministers might conceivably want to commission to argue their case. So uh, who, but everybody knows that that's not going to be possible consistent with the guidance, so people aren't asking for them. So we who, aren't running into who, any real difficulties at the moment. Who decides because. that the minister is going to use that information for his own uh, means if he's wanting out of the EU? Well, the way it would work is the permanent section would form a judgment. If there's a disagreement, then I, it would be referred to myself and probably the Prime Minister politically or Ed Llewellyn, and we'd have to form a view on whether it was a reasonable request or not. But your, your, your so briefing actually says that um, they're to withhold papers which are intended to be used in support of their position on the referendum. That's briefing and speech material, basically. So, so it doesn't include facts and statistics? Well, as I've said, I mean, yeah. well, okay. statistics, statistics are very clear. The Minister's access to official national statistics will continue on the same basis as now without any interruption. And facts are dealt with uh, in a separate paragraph of the, of the document. Hmm. I mean, so, I'm, I'm really struggling to understand what the problem is here, Scott. It's well, based on the 1975 it, it, guidance, it's based it, it, on the Scottish it, it, referendum. I think it could have been cleared up a lot quicker if it's as simple as that, Mr. Cowan. Maybe I can help you there. Will there ever be a case where the paper does relate to the, the question of the EU referendum and yet it's passed to a minister who is pro leaving the EU? Well, I mean, I'm really going to get into hypothetical cases here. The spirit of this is very clear. The these are, is, these are situations where it's going to happen and people are going to have to make decisions. Well, they haven't happened so far. That's all I can say. All I, all I can say is the spirit of this is very clear. There's an official government position, there's official government business, and anybody who's supporting that official government business will get in, in, in the same civil service support as usual. In one area alone, in those cases where ministers have decided they want to oppose the government's official policy, 
uh, the civil service will not be expected to provide briefing material or speech material to support that case against the government. And I think it would be quite wrong if the civil service was involved in that. It would be a very significant change in the civil service's role in uh, our country. To be actively briefing ministers against the government's policy would be a very significant change, and I wouldn't support it. Um, I don't think anybody in the cabinet is asking for well, that, to be honest. How, 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 the how, how can an official determine what the intention of a minister is? Uh, well, it, it, fortunately, the motive doesn't come into it because it's very clear that briefing and speech material supporting the out position isn't going to be provided. And that's what the guidance says, that's what the Prime Minister's letter says. So it, it doesn't require any sort of great uh, telepathy. So, so then you, you're, you're presuming that a minister who wants to leave would use that information as part of his campaign to leave Europe? Well, even, even, a, even if he thought it was more important to do a performance duty as a, as a cabinet minister? I don't see any clash here because was, we're not going to deny ministers uh, information that they need to run their departments. Well, that's very reassuring. Um, Oliver, well, no, no, just very, very, very briefly. Oh, yeah. It's interesting that the Code for Civil Service dictates that the, the core values are honesty, objectivity, impartiality and integrity, which must, must be observed at all times. But we seem to be saying that a Cabinet Minister, given that same opportunity, would not be able to adhere to those standards. I'm not suggesting that at all. I'm just simply saying that. So you're not going to give information to do his My job. My responsibility is for the Civil Service, and the Civil Service will operate in line with Civil Service values. You're not, going to, you're not going to give him all the information to do his job? No, you, to you also not listen to my answer. I'm oh, saying yeah. that we will supply information required for ministers to run their departments. Mm. The only information we won't be prepared to supply them with, in line with the guidance, in line with 75, in line with Scotland, is material required to make the case against the government. And that is not, uh, no one's asking for that information, I might add, uh, and the guidance would stop us from doing it. So in the unlikely event of a minister... Though in, though in 1975 the civil service did provide that. That information well, not, according to the, not according to Harold Wilson's memo, did it? I haven't read the piece of biography that you, you're quoting. Um, in terms of neutral information, but not, not, not speeches or... We, my guidance says we can, we can check facts. Um, um, Oliver Dowden, and then I'll come to David Jones. Yes, I was going to come to this 1975 guidance. Hmm. Um, so do you think that this guidance is different to the 1975 guidance? And if so, how do you think it's different? I think it's broadly the same, to be honest. I, I'm not going to tie myself slavishly to it being precisely the same because I've got my guidance and I've, I've just read out the 75 version of it but to all intents and purposes as Peter Riddle says today in his blog it's broadly the same basically we're not supplying briefing and speech material to ministers who want to argue against the government position so you, you can't identify sort of specific differences between 1975 and I think there's a, a I haven't got all my briefing notes with me but I think there's a specific difference in relation to special advisers conceivably, but in relation to civil servants. I mean, we don't express it exactly the same way, uh, but basically it gets to the same point, which is the material that we're not providing to ministers is material that they could use to attack the government position, because there's an official government position, and the civil service would be literally tying itself up in knots if it was supporting the government position, but also supporting ministers to attack the government position. Sorry, Dave, do you want to? Yes, uh, Sir Jeremy, you used the expression briefing material. Briefing material, I, I take it, is another word for facts, factual material. It's arguments you could use to, to uh, rebut an, uh, know, an alternative position and so on. So Argu arguments. arguments rather than facts. Yes. So factual material has to be supplied. If a minister asks uh, to see facts, then I think we'd be very, very relaxed about that. It's facts are facts. And we certainly have some media commentary that actually there'll be two sets of facts. It's just well wide of the mark. Yes, but, but there may be factual material such as, for example, data, statistics, of which the Minister is unaware. Would uh, the official be expected to withhold that material if it might be used by the, the Minister in connection with a, a campaign to leave no, I think If we're just talking about pure facts, uh, we wouldn't expect to withhold those from ministers, no. So, so, so can I just come back to the point? The point is we want to withhold briefing material, speech material that allows ministers who want to argue against the government position to use the civil service resources to attack the government. That's what we're trying to stop here. Every other part of government business, including EU business, facts, access to official statistics, carries on as now. So, uh, for example, statistics that are newly minted, newly prepared statistics in connection with, uh, in connection with the campaign to stay within the EU could be supplied to a minister who wished to leave the EU. Is that right? Uh, factual information I don't think there's any great difficulty with, no, because I, I think you've got to understand the spirit of this thing, which was, I wouldn't say the guidance was agreed collectively because it's the Prime Minister's job to, to, to 
everybody agreed that what we're trying to do here is to find a way of the two sets of ministers rubbing along well together, whilst arguing different sides of uh, an argument and not dragging the civil service out of its constitutional role, which is to support the official government policy. We, we read in the Times yesterday that um, officials of the Department for Work and Pensions had been engaged by Number 10 to uh, produce some st statistical material uh, without the knowledge of the Secretary of State, Ian Duncan Smith. Is that right? Uh, well, I haven't read that article, but um, uh, well, sure, I, I, don't think, aware. I don't think the Secretary of State for Welfare is concerned about where we are at the moment. I expect him about it today. Uh, I'm very clear that if he wants to see the statistics that his officials are sharing with Number 10, that's fine. Do you think it's right that officials in the DWP should be engaged on producing statistics for the benefit of Number 10 without his knowledge? Uh, well, that happens all the time, frankly. I mean, we, the, the civil service operates well below ministerial level on some issues. You know, if, if officials in Number 10 or the Cabinet Office want some factual imp information from another department, that often happens without ministers being involved in the slightest. But if, if the Secretary of State wants to see some statistical information that his department is providing, of course they can see, he can see it. So you regard it as quite acceptable that the Secretary of State should be completely unaware of work that has been carried out, uh, out by his own officials in his own department on behalf of Number 10? I think it would be literally impossible for a minister to know everything that was going on in his department. Literally impossible. But, but, but Sir Jeremy, in my, in my experience, um, which I appreciate is limited, um, if Number 10 asked for information from my department, my officials would run it across my desk before it came across well, to me. What I'm saying very clearly, I think, is that... Is that if and I'm sure that's the same for many other sectors of state. They want to make sure the calibre of work going up to Number 10 was absolutely first class. Oh, I, that's, I'm very glad to hear it. But, uh, but, but, the, but the point is that the, there would be no conspiracy of, amongst officials to deny ministers cited that information, even if they were on the leave side of the debate. No, we're, it, 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 it talk of conspiracy or bypassing is no, well right. wide of the mark. Right, okay. There is no intention of doing that. The only intentions I repeat again for the umpteenth time is to make it clear that the civil service is not going to be supporting ministers who are against the government's <laughs> position to, to enable them to make that case. Although they can have full access to all factual material that they want, whether or not it's been prepared for the campaign or otherwise. Uh, well, we're, I'm very comfortable about ministers seeing facts that are provided by the department, yeah. Um, are you finished, Mr. Jones? I think I am, actually. Um, Kate, how are you? Thank you. So, Jeremy, do you think this has all been worth it? Do you think you've actually... Again? Do you think this all palaver that we've gone through in the last has been worth it, actually? Do you not think you could have produced guidance which might have been a little bit more clear, sensible and common sense? I think my guidance is clear so uh, and common sense. Do you, think, <laughs> do you think that your, the permanent secretaries in all departments uh, will be absolutely clear and civil servants right across the civil service be absolutely clear about your guidance? Well, my experience over many years now has been that in the first week or two of one of these periods of campaign, there are always lots of detailed questions. So it takes a bit of time for everybody to get up the learning curve and understand what, you know, what the answers are to the detailed practical, question, uh, practical questions. So I couldn't hand on heart say every single civil servant is now completely au fait with all of this detail. But within the matter of the next few days and weeks, I'm sure that will be the position. We'll continue to refine and update our Q&A until it answers everybody's questions. Well, we had Sir Jonathan Stevens um, this morning, and I just wonder if you'd like to take a specific example dealing with the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland. Uh, and by the way, I see you refer in your, your letter, paragraph 3, to um, has been to negotiate a new settlement <coughs> for Britain. I presume you mean the United Kingdom. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I accept. My, my letter is not completely perfect. Good. Um, but on the, that, we have a Secretary of State for Northern Ireland who has made it clear that she's supporting leave. Yep. Um, so, Jonathan, would, would he, every single, there's a lots of it, every day there'll be something about the European Union passing over the desk in, in Northern Ireland, particularly in the relationship with the Republic of Ireland. Uh, Will the Secretary of State be shown absolutely everything that comes through that office where the word EU is mentioned? Uh, well, I can't say that because I've said there's a, uh, a clear carve out here for briefing material and speech material and so on. Uh, I can't really think of any other information that she wouldn't be able to see in the normal course of business, running her department, as, as you've said. I've not 
had any suggestion that she's unhappy with this guidance or that Jonathan is having any difficulty in applying it in practice. Uh, I think he's talked to her about it. Um, so, so far, so good. But, you know, can obviously you, we'll be keeping them alert. Can you give to, us an example that when you were writing your guidance that you might think she would not be able to see or, uh, or any other, and particularly in relation to Northern Ireland, actually, I'm, I'm looking for? Uh, yes, any speech material or briefing. You see, use this speech material and briefing, you really should be defining that because you've, you've said earlier that there's not any difference, material difference between this and what Harold Wilson and Civil Service did in 1975. Mm. And yet in that it seemed to be clear that they were going to be able to be given facts on both sides of, of the argument and then the minister would be able to use that in whatever they, way they wanted. That's not going to happen this time. Well, no, I mean, we're not providing proactive material factual or argument, argumentative to ministers who are arguing against the government. But can I just clarify, why wasn't Sir Jonathan Stevens clear about this this exactly. morning? Because he was saying yes. something completely different. When we tried to ask him the question, yes. you know, what information you know, that might have a bearing on the referendum question uh, that the minister would not be able to see, um, he sort of treated this as a hypothetical question. He didn't just say it's only if it's speech material or briefing in favour of one side of the argument. Um, he was much more guarded in what he was saying, so he clearly didn't understand what you intended by your guidance and briefing. Well, I can't speak for Jonathan, I'll, have, I'll speak to him later, but I don't, all I can say is I don't think he's got any problem in practice in the way this guidance... Well, clearly not now, but there was this morning. No, I, think, I, I, don't, I, I was told that he, he told the committee that there, there hadn't been a problem so far, but maybe, maybe I was misinformed. Um, did, he, did he flag up a major concern that he had with his sexual Oh, no, 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 of course, of course, no, it, no, everything, think, everything in the garden Did he flag very, up any concern at all? Did he flag up any concern at all about the way this guidance is being applied in his department? Um, can he? I just probably you because He just couldn't answer the question, that's all. Well, maybe um, that's because he had no, no problems in the prison. Um, he it, couldn't answer the guidance is so clear. Cabinet Secretary, he couldn't answer the question because he didn't want to answer the question. Um, no. um, Kate Hoey. Yes, I just... Uh, just Finally, obviously, you discussed this in great detail before you produced this, I'm sure, with the Prime Minister. Do you really think the public, the British public, who are going to have this vote on June the 23rd, actually will not be beginning to think, why has the Prime Minister done this? Is this, what is he hiding? What, what, what is to fear about ministers having seen everything and being able to see everything. Sure, we want this open and transparent debate. What, what, what is there? Is there something that's worrying him? Well, I wouldn't presume to, uh, to comment on what the British people want, but I think that people, as the Chairman said at the start, are more interested in the substantive issues than the interstices of the Cabinet Secretary's guidance, let alone his Q&A at working level. But I agree, it's good to get this cleared up, because the spirit of this is very clear. The, government, the Civil Service works for the official government position uh, it doesn't provide material to those who want to oppose it uh, of a briefing nature or a speech nature. But otherwise, the business as usual carries on, whether it's EU business or government business. But it certainly doesn't do anything to undermine ministers' accountability for their departments, their ability to answer PQs in a complete fashion, and so on. That's not the intention. The intention is to limit this to the very small area that's been a profoundly important area, but actually limited area where collective responsibility has been uh, abandoned uh, for this period, uh, and that is the in-out question and, and the specific okay. issues around the Thank campaign. You. That is the point of this guidance. Okay. Can I just ask about the position of junior ministers? Yes. Um, because, you know, if you have a junior minister in a department, a uh, pro-leave junior minister, where the Secretary of State um, is, is, is pro-remain or even indeed vice versa, um, she, one of the problems is, is the relationship between the officials and the ministers together because one of those ministers, potentially a junior minister, is going to be left out of the loop because if at some stage some briefing material um, comes down that is interpreted by someone somewhere in the department, possibly the pro permanent secretary who may suffer from overload if this is really um, going to be, be bedded in into to certain departments, is going to be missing out on part of the information. Aren't you worried that that junior minister um, for example, a, 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 an agricultural minister may not be able to discharge their duty as a minister if you're withholding briefings that are available to other ministers in the department, but not the individual that's a pro-leave minister. 
Well, I'm not really worried about it because the only briefing that's going to be withheld is briefing on the question of the in-out decision and uh, material that supports the campaign out. And I, think, I think it would be completely wrong to the civil service, uh, which has a legal obligation to support the government of the day, to be supporting ministers who want to argue against the government position. So if, if a junior minister, say in work and pensions, um, wanted to see um, the national insurance numbers issued to EU migrants, for example, um, you'd allow them to have that material. You just wouldn't allow them to have that material with any comment on it from the officials. If there's factual material that is generally available in the department, I think uh, we, we would, I think I'd have to discuss it with the Prime Minister, but I'm pretty sure he'd be comfortable about that being shared. So a junior minister can actually ask for any information whatsoever in terms of facts. Um, and Factual information we've said in the guidance. Yep. We will, yep. we will okay. check facts. But uh, just can't ask for a speech to be prepared that is against government policy. Or briefing. Or briefing. Arguments so, to use, rebuttal points, yep. you know, those sorts of issues. No, because it's not right for ministers who've chosen personally to exempt themselves from collective responsibility <laughs> should continue to get the full weight of support from the civil service to enable them to attack the government. Um, on the question of national insurance numbers, uh, we have today, I believe, published the, um, uh, the proposals for the changes to FOI. Um, but for some reason, a Freedom of Information request submitted by Jonathan Porters, who is a former Chief Economist at the Cabinet Office, uh, for the number of national insurance numbers, active national insurance numbers, held by EU migrants in the United Kingdom. Um, is being withheld by HMRC, originally withheld on grounds that um, officials are engaged, in, uh, engaged to secure support from the European Commission and other member states for changes in EU law governing EU migrants' access to benefits. Well, now that these negotiations are over, um, what is the purpose of withholding this information? Uh, I'm afraid, Mr. Chairman, I'm not familiar with the, uh, the argumentation behind that. Well, I mean, uh, uh, there's no reason that why the number of uh, national insurance numbers uh, held by EU migrants should be kept secret, is that? I don't want to second guess a decision that has been made somewhere else. That well, well could I invite you to look into the matter I will, and find pleasure. out why it was withheld on grounds of, on those grounds from a Freedom of Information request mm -hmm. and whether it can now be released because it would, seem to be, it, it would seem to fall into that category of information that the government might regard as unhelpful because our immigration statistics are notoriously inaccurate and it might point to a much higher level of immigration uh, than is recorded by the annual passenger survey information, which is only an estimate. Um, can I also ask um, your guidance? Does it, it, it is directed at civil servants and special advisers. Mm. Why has a permanent secretary written to the head of a public sector body, an arm's length body, to someone who's not a civil servant, implying that the guidance should apply to them as well. Do, is it intended to apply to them as well? Uh, I think it does apply to uh, public bodies as well, yes. I mean, but not, not to non-civil servants, surely? Uh, it says staff in public bodies, like all public servants, are required to maintain political impartiality. Yes, but your guidance was not addressed to public servants who are not civil servants. Uh, I think it is, actually, uh, but I will come back to you on that specific point. But, I mean, how, I mean is, it meant, is it intended to apply to, say, non-executive directors of government departments? Uh, they're also mentioned in the guidance, as you'll see. I mean, is it, who is it not intended to apply to? It's not intended to apply to people who are not referred to in the letter. It seems to apply to um, businessmen seeking peerages, for example. No, it certainly doesn't, from, doesn't apply to the private sector. We hear no. whispers from, indirectly from special advisers uh, inveighing upon them to tow the government line. Um, but um, uh, surely, surely a, um, a non-civil servant who's taken on a public role is not meant to be bound by the collective responsibility of the government. Uh, my guidance does apply to certain public servants, but whether it applies to all of them, I'll have to take clearer and more detailed advice on and come back to you. Well, if you could write to me on that, I'd be very I'm grateful. Going to sack them if they, um, go against it. Uh, I don't want to get into hypothetical discussions about that. Well, we're, we're going to come to sanctions later on. Um, <laughs> could, um, David Jones. Yes, I, I, to what, are you entirely satisfied, Sir Jeremy, that none of these, um, none of these uh, directions you've given uh, in any way contravene the, minister, uh, the civil service code? Absolutely, yes. Because... Um, Civil servants have a duty under the code uh, of honesty and objectivity. Hmm. 
Absolutely. Um, the duty of honesty requires a civil servant to set out the facts and relevant issues truthfully and correct any errors as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. um, if uh, a minister should ask for information uh, and it is uh, withheld from that minister because uh, the permanent secretary or whoever deems that it's going to be used in connection with campaigning for Britain to leave the EU, and, uh, and if that minister then proceeds to make a speech or write an article based upon information that is not actually factual because the information has been withheld, has not that official breached the, the civil service code? Well, I, the guidance makes it very clear that civil servants are able to check the facts of speeches. <clears throat> but also we're talking here about ministers who are operating in a personal capacity, uh, not in a ministerial uh, you know, they're not observing collective responsibility in that way. Uh, so I'm very satisfied that this guidance is fully consistent with the Civil Service Code. Um, ministers who are wanting to take a different view from the government policy can ask the Civil Service to check their speeches for facts, if that's the point you're concerned about. And I think I've made it repeatedly clear there's been no intention of withholding key facts from ministers who are uh, arguing a different way. So I don't, I don't think the problem arises in the way that you suggest. Thank you. Um, is that it? Um, I am, I, I, Kate, do you want to ask anything further? I'd like to go on to sanctions sometime. Yes, do. No? Mm -hmm. Okay, well, very interested. What are you going to do when somebody, either a junior minister or a secretary of state or a civil servant, kind of um, looks like they've broken, broken this guidance that's been so carefully constructed? Uh, well, I don't really like speculating about hypothetical situations. It, w it would be entirely up to the Prime Minister to decide what to do about ministers who breached this in some way. Um, civil servants? I, civil servants. Yours? I would regard it as a very serious breach of um, the management code if they breached the guidelines on this. But uh, I mean, it's very difficult to comment in the abstract. It depends on the gravity of the offence, whether it was intended, or all, all those normal things. So, a, a civil servant who get some information through about the European Union, thinks that the minister should see it because it's relevant, for example, a junior minister in DEFRA where practically everything they do is EU related. Um, and by some fluke or mistake, just happens to hand it on to the minister who then sees this as quite an important issue and relevant to the debate on leave or remaining. Um, would, would that civil servant be penalized? Honestly, it doesn't make any sense to speculate about abstract theoretical cases. We'd obviously look at it in the, in the round using a common sense approach. Well, what does that mean? I mean, I, if I was a civil servant now, I'd be feeling quite worried, given that I'm not quite sure what, what would happen to me if, some, if I make a mistake and it gets into the papers because a minister has taken up something that I've given to them, not realising that it... Well, I, I, I simply don't think that's a position. I mean, we're obviously speaking all the time to departments and getting feedback on whether or not they're feeling worried and anxious about this. And of course there are teething issues and there are clarifications required and we need to evolve this. But it's just simply not the case that people are sitting there paralysed with fear. Because it's very clear what we're trying to do here. We're trying to keep the government business on track, as it always is, including EU business in the normal course of events. But on the very small number of civil servants affected by the need to brief ministers one way or the other on the campaign. These rules are pretty clear. There, there, isn't, there isn't any great sort of ambiguity about them. So you know, I genuinely, I mean, maybe I've been complacent. I don't think so. I don't, I don't think there's a sort of widespread sort of anxiety and worry about this. Everybody realizes it's a very unusual position when you've got some ministers of the Crown who wish to argue against the government's position, against the Prime Minister's position. Uh, but everybody's trying to make the best of it and in a, in, a, in a sort of collaborative spirit, and that's what we're trying to do here. But it wasn't in the government's manifesto that they would be campaigning to remain in the EU. So does that not actually go against the fact that it's you know, a government-mandated decision? It's something that the majority of the cabinet have decided. It's not actually a... No, I mean, the, the, the government's come to a very clear position. Everybody agrees that is the government's position, even though some ministers don't agree with it. The government set out in its manifesto what it was trying to achieve in the renegotiation. It's for the Prime Minister to defend whether or not we achieved that. He thinks he did. The government sat 
round the table, looked at the deal, and agreed this was the government position. So there are no there are no sanctions, basically. You haven't got a list of no. That's not what I said. I'm, just not gonna, I'm not going to give you a, g- a generic answer to a case in which there will be lots of personal circumstances to understand mm-hmm. whether you know, they've been given proper guidance by their permanent secretary, whether it was a well-intentioned mistake. I don't think sort of sack someone for one minor offence, but in general, I think there's an exception. So this is this is right. That basically, the civil service should support the government of the day in its official position whilst endeavouring to support every Minister of the Crown okay. on all the other bits of business that have to go on. But ju- just for clarity, supposing there was a conflict between the instructions handed down to a civil servant and what the civil servant felt his or her obligations were under the code, mm-hmm. in those circumstances the code should prevail. Is that correct? The civil service code should prevail, yes. yes. Absolutely. And if, if, uh, if, if the instructions were persisted with, the civil servant could go to the civil service commissioner for an adjudication on whether he was being obliged to or asked to breach the code. Uh, yes, but I, I, I can't imagine the circumstances arising no. because well, there's clearly nothing in this guidance which requires the civil hope, service to breach the code. I, I, I agree. I, I very much hope and that just won't happen. Just a clarification. I did hear you say earlier. I think I just want to make this, have this clear in my mind that the judge and jury in these instances, should they arise, is yourself, the prime minister, and Mr. Edward Llewellyn. Those three people I think you mentioned. Well, I think the Prime Minister is judge and jury when it comes to ministerial conduct. And myself, I will have the first line uh, when it comes to civil service conduct. But as the Chairman has just said, there's always an appeal to or an involvement of the uh, Civil Service Commission uh, on code issues. And you mentioned Mr Llewellyn, though. What role has he got? Well, if there was a dispute as to whether or not a minister's activity or request to a civil servant is taking us into a dangerous territory that might be incompatible with the guidance. I'm sure we discuss that and try and resolve it amicably rather than just assuming that everyone was operating in bad faith. That's not how the yeah. government operates. Yeah, I'm very glad to hear it. But um, there is a tendency perhaps to feel that in the private sector everything would be referenced to the chief executive of the company. Mm-hmm. But in government uh, there are that different rules apply, like the code, which is mentioned in statute and overseen by the Civil Service Commissioner. There is a, there is a different framework. It can't just be referenced to you, can it? No, the, 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 the Civil Service Commission exists to, mm. to, as a backstop on that, in that way. But let me just... Um, you know, I don't believe that anything that we're suggesting here is going to bring anybody into non-compliance with the Civil Service Code. I I'm very encouraged to hear an that. An extraordinary suggestion, in a way, because there's nothing in here that could possibly do so. Right. The civil service has an obligation under the code to support the elected government of the day, and that's mm-hmm. what we're doing. So do you think the media and everybody, including all of us here and, and the chairman who wanted you to come, are making a fuss over nothing? Uh, I wouldn't possibly say that. <laughs> You're terribly generous. Um, David Jones. <laughs> you have, I think, weekly meetings with permanent secretaries. Has the uh, issue of the conduct of the referendum, and specifically the guidance that you have, have issued, been discussed in one of those meetings? Yes, it has, yeah. How recently was that? Uh, I think we had a meeting last week with the Permanent Secretaries and the Directors General. <coughs> amongst many other things, we discussed this. We was, uh, was Sir Jonathan Stevens <coughs> present at that meeting? Um, I don't think he was, actually. Mm. Ah, so well, he was or he wasn't? I don't think he was. I can't that, remember. That, that, that may possibly account for the fact that he didn't appear to be across the, uh, the circumstances that are prevailing according to... It is possible, but I think it's today. much more likely that there hasn't been a problem on his watch and therefore it hasn't sort of been something he needed to spend a lot of time thinking about. Have you uh, given any other instructions other than your, uh, your letter of guidance and your Q&A to, to your colleagues about the way that they should uh, handle the, uh, the, the internal dealings in their departments up to the referendum? No. So there's the, that's the only guidance that exists? Well, we had a conversation uh, last week. And uh, the discussion by, that you had, mm-hmm. which was presumably by way of clarification of what yeah, was in there. absolutely. And no, I mean, the, the guidance, the Prime Minister's letter is the overarching document. My letter is the, the sort of putting the flesh on it, and that is the guidance. The Q&A will, will continue to update it over time. Thank you. Um, Tom. Uh, what is your estimate of the number of Council of Ministers meetings that uh, pro-leave ministers may now attend between now and the referendum date? Have you got a... mm, I, haven't, I haven't done an estimate of that, to be honest. Um, I, don't, I mean, generally they run at about five or ten a month, I think, from memory. Um, I don't know how many of those would involve out-ministers, um, but there's no reason why an out-minister can't attend. 
uh, and represent the UK on normal EU business. And then we'll get full briefing from civil servants to do so. No change in that at all. And of course, were they to get a briefing, and I know this would never happen, but were they to get a briefing and then change their mind as to whether they were in or out, that wouldn't have any material impact at all on the briefing they got either? Well, there's nothing I can do about that. If people change their minds, they change their minds. And uh, what sort of material will be provided to these ministers? Just It'll be a very comprehensive and excellent brief by the civil service. Naturally. Okay. Nice. Um, I, j I just wanted to, to, to ask about the relationship between um, senior civil servants and, say, their Secretary of State. Mm. I mean, they are usually very good, and uh, quite frankly, um, it's not possible for you or anybody else that would adjudicate to, to be present in all situations um, when a civil servant is, is talking to a Secretary of State. So the truth of the matter is, is that this is totally unenforceable because um, a senior civil servant, if he's having an, uh, a conversation with the Secretary of State, um, can actually use that conversation um, to, 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 to brief or to discuss statistics or facts um, and look at the way in which it's going to be affected by the referendum. Indeed, you would expect that in a way because the implications of this referendum will have enormous uh, repercussions in some departments. So how can you police this? I mean, it's, it's lovely to get the letter from the Prime Minister and the clear instructions and the Q&A, but the truth of the matter is, is that practically you can't enforce it or police it at all, and it's caused an awful furore. Well, uh, it's largely going to be self-policed because I think there's a general, <laughs> general consent for the proposition that we're putting forward, which is that the civil service should support the government's well, position. They would uh, say that anyway, wouldn't they? <laughs> but I'm not aware that any minister who's subject to the constraints, it feels that they're unreasonable. I'm not aware of a minister seeking the civil servant, asking civil servants to write them a speech attacking the government's policy. It just isn't happening because the people, everybody accepts that, uh, that it's the right thing for the civil service to support the government side of this argument. And for, if people want to derogate from that in a personal capacity, then they'll have to make their own arguments. And most of them want to do Mr. that. Mr. Tugendhat. There, you have had no conversations at all with any Secretary of State or Minister of the Crown of any sort which has raised any concerns over the note that you have produced. I've had one conversation with one Secretary of State around uh, a question mark about facts, uh, the availability of facts provided by his department. Uh, and that was, uh, I had that conversation today. And, and that has been resolved? Well, I believe so, yeah. And they, the, the impression they gave you was that it was resolved? Uh, no, it wasn't resolved at the point at which we had the discussion. It was a question was raised at the point of the discussion. But is it the truth of the matter that in the current atmosphere that pertains, um, it would be highly unlikely for a junior minister to raise it with you or, or for, for any others? Um, well, since the extremely uh, approachable individual. Oh, uh, but of course. I, I concur but it's just, with that. But it is just... Uh, Mr Jones, uh, I, I, I wonder, Sir Jeremy, were you surprised by the expressions of outrage coming from both sides of the House yesterday afternoon? I, I was genuinely surprised because I, I, you know, and that's why I welcomed the opportunity to come here because I don't think there's much to see here, to be honest. Well, well, well <laughs> g g g given the, the expressions of outrage, would you possibly accept that your guidance could have been a bit clearer so that people would not have got the wrong end of the stick? Uh, well, I'm always happy to take feedback. And that being the case, do you think that you might go away and rewrite your guidance? No, I think the guidance is very clear. I think possibly, <laughs> possibly the Q&A. No, possibly no. the Q&A can do with a bit of update. The Q&A, you, you, you will be revisiting that. Uh, it's always been our intention to update that. And right. Right. Yes, revisit it. So, I think you've seen the David Arkin where the poet source close to uh, Mr Ian Duncan Smith uh, <coughs> saying that he's going to He's going to insist on his constitutional rights uh, to see everything produced in his department. I mean, he's putting two fingers up to this arrangement, isn't he? Uh, well, I'm, I mean, I'm presumably, not it's a very plausible story. I've said very clearly that ministers who support the outside of the argument will not be able to commission a briefing from their civil servants on speech material or briefing. But, and that is clear. I don't think Ian Duncan Smith has any difficulty with that. He certainly hasn't asked his civil servants to produce material for him to attack the government with. And I wouldn't expect him to do so. So, so isn't it, in practical terms, unworkable to have the head of the department divide, divide information that his juniors can have 
and it's not going to happen. Uh, wouldn't the sensible thing be to say, well, those ministers who can't agree with government policy should do what uh, ministers have always done and disagree with, with government policy, and that's resign. It's just for the period uh, yeah, until so. June the 24th. I think this is perfectly workable. Um, can I just ask one other thing? Um, the government's producing a number of documents, like this one here, the process of withdrawing from the European Union. Mm. Um, and um, um, are these documents consulted around Whitehall as usual? cross-departmental documents would be consulted around? Um, well, we've done two so far, and each of them has been done in a slightly different mm. way. But I mean, this, this one contains quite a lot about trade, for example. Uh, was it cleared with the uh, Secretary of State for Business, Innovation and Skills and the Trade Minister? Uh, I think it was, yes. Um, when, when, was it, when did they first see it? Uh, I couldn't tell you that. Um, um, when did they approve it? I, I don't have those figures in my head, those dates in could, my head. Could, could you let us know when this was passed to that, that department and approved by them? I'm sure. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I, I think in summary, Cabinet Secretary, you've been very helpful. Thank you and very much. it always pains you and worries you when I say you've been helpful. Um, but you read out the words from the 1975 guidance. Civil servants may provide normal office facilities and factual information on European matters on request to ministers who differ from the government's recommendation, but they should not be asked to provide briefing or draft speeches contrary to the government's recommendations. You've confirmed that they can have any facts, and we assume that that means that um, that's any facts that are being passed to number 10 or the Cabinet Office uh, to be used on whatever side of the argument. Yes? Uh, um, well, I've, said, I've specifically said several times that I would going to refer back to my own guidance rather than this. I'm saying it's broadly similar. Yes, to but I'm mean, just just for clarity's sake. If, for example, number ten asks for new estimates of how much money will be saved to the to the benefits bill by the changes effected by the agreement at, at, at Brussels um, from claims by EU migrants in the UK over the next few years, those facts would be available to the Secretary of State, just as they would be I think to that the would Prime be very Minister. Reasonable. I, I think that would be very reasonable yes. to, okay. to make sure so that we're just we're talking not, about purely factual information. So, so we're, not, in, we're, arguments, we're so. not inviting civil servants to try and distinguish between facts uh, which they wouldn't proactively produce uh, for a minister just because they've been asked for by somebody else. Yeah, we're not producing proactive information. No, for okay, who want that, to that's argue fine, because I think position. it's very important for the impartiality of the civil service that the information that the civil service is producing in terms of facts and figures is objective information, and I'm sure you Absolutely. would agree with that. Of course. Um, um, so why are we having this row? And I think it's because your letter, um, if I may reiterate, says, as I read earlier, it will not be appropriate or permissible for civil servants... Uh, to provide official departmental papers, accepting papers that ministers have previously seen, on issues relating to the referendum question. This goes much wider than, than briefings and speech material. It doesn't say briefings and speech material. It's clearly referring to providing briefings well, and speech material. As there's it, a, as there's a degree of ambiguity that. there. And in, in your, in your Q&A, you make it clear... Um, they can see or commission any papers produced by the departments in the normal way, except those that have a bearing on the referendum question. And that is potentially a much broader definition than you are now yeah, explaining you, to us. But the Q&A is nested within the well, guidance. It, in order, I mean, can I give, give perhaps advice that I think my committee might share, is that all this guidance and Q&A should be withdrawn, and you should produce something much more concise and clear, as was produced in 1975, and then we needn't have had this row. Uh, well, I don't agree with that at all. I, mean, I think the guidance is extremely concise and clear, and we certainly aren't going to be withdrawing it. But it's been a very good opportunity well, I'm very to glad you, what it means. Well, I, I think people should read this transcript and read what you've said today, rather than the guidance you've issued, because I think it's very much clearer. Well, uh, what you've said today well, the guidance you've issued. Nobody's having any difficulty with my guidance on the ground. So. Well, I'm very glad to hear it. Um, we have successfully cleared up this problem, that ministers are now going to see all the facts that they want to see and all the figures that they want to see, all the figures yeah, and facts all the, all the that facts are leaving that have their been, departments. All the facts that have been provided yep. to number 10. Um, and um, uh, problem solved. Cabinet Secretary, thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much. Order, order.